Welcome to Convocation. That's right. I hope we're all so happy to be here. As you all know, we mark the start of this academic year with this gathering. I'm Reverend Jackie Marquez, Dean of Religious and Spiritual Life. The last 18 months have presented us with challenges we could have never imagined. Think of everything we've gone through and overcome to be here now. We have experienced grief, loss, moments of growth, joy, resilience, and courage. And we are together again to celebrate yet another academic year in the life of our college. I invite us to share in a brief moment of reflection and prayer, each in our own way, for the world, the Wellesley College community, and for ourselves. We come from many faith practices, religions, spiritual and philosophical traditions that speak to us, offering ancient guidance. So let us pray. Sacred source of all that is good and beautiful and true. In you we live and move and have our being. We pause to give thanks for all that you have guided us through. We are grateful that we are able to gather once again as a community. We ask your presence to be with us as we walk into this new season, unsure of what lies ahead, yet trusting that you go before us. In this moment, we bless our students in their doubts and certainties and pray that as their knowledge increases, so too will their compassion and commitment to the greater good. May their decisions lead to a life full of meaning and purpose. We ask your blessings upon our academic, professional, and personal endeavors. Help our community speak words of life and inspiration to one another in the days ahead. May we encourage each other in love and gentleness as we journey through this academic year. As we gather in peace, we remember those near and far for whom peace is an elusive hope, and we entrust them to you. God of all times and all places, be with us now as we gather in joyful celebration. Amen. It is now my pleasure to introduce Wellesley College President, Paula A. Johnson. Dean Marquez, oh my goodness. This is just, I, before I start, I just have to say, this is just so wonderful to see all of you here filling this amphitheater. Um, Dean Marquez, thank you for those beautiful and very meaningful, inspiring words. And thank you also to our student group, Yanvalu, directed by alumna Kira Washington, class of 93, for, as always, bringing their lively music to our procession. So good afternoon. Welcome to all of you at the start of Wellesley's 147th year. It is so wonderful to be together in person. A special welcome to the incoming Green Class of 2025. <laughs> to our seven new Davis Scholars. And to our two new transfer students. We are so happy to have you among us. Welcome, too, to our new faculty and to our new administrative and union staff. And a big welcome back to all of our returning students. We are thrilled to have you back. To the intrepid class of 2024, this is your first convocation, too. We are delighted that you are here with us. <laughs> to
to our juniors and seniors, the brilliant yellow class of 2023 and the fantastic purple class of 2022, the keepers of our traditions, the passers on of Wellesley's wisdom. It is great to be with you today. As the green class will soon discover, Wellesley students tend to be both original and inspiring. In fact, my theme today, time and its strangeness during this pandemic, was inspired by a student project. It was Shakespeare who inspired Charnel Jones, class of 23. <laughs> She was inspired namely by a speech in The Winter's Tale, when time itself comes on stage to justify suddenly forwarding the action 16 years. In response, Charnel made a very simple but profoundly moving video that captures the deceptive nature of time in a world of social distancing. For four minutes without moving, the camera records the view from her front door, a quiet courtyard of townhouses in Detroit, while Moses Sumney's mournful song, Am I Doomed, plays. Only when cars zoom past and the occasional person scurries into a neighboring door do we realize that this is a time-lapse video that was filmed over many hours. The video seems to ask whether time has been compressed during our pandemic solitude so that the eventless hours feel like, feel like mere minutes? Or has it stretched out endlessly in the sameness of every day? All of us have experienced such pandemic doldrums. I had high hopes that we would be fully past them at this point and that the miraculously rapid development of effective vaccines against COVID-19 would mean that we were emerging from the pandemic. Yet, because of so many shortcomings in our own society and a lack of concern for the entire world, we have seen the advent of the Delta variant with its high transmissibility, and we are emerging more haltingly than we had thought. In a sense, a new virus such as SARS-CoV-2 reveals the capricious nature of time. Any infection with an r naught or basic reproductive number greater than one can potentially spread exponentially. If nothing is done, we are fast forwarding from a few cases to many, many more. Change can overwhelm us. While we have fought back by requiring vaccination in many settings, we have also for, fought back by forcing the hands of the clock to move more slowly, hunkering down, wearing masks, and restricting our movements and social contacts as we have been doing since March of 2020. The past year and a half also revealed other tricks of time. It became starkly clear that as a country, we have not moved as far towards social justice and gender equality as we had thought or hoped. The tragic deaths of George Floyd and so many others, the fact that minorities suffered far worse health outcomes from COVID-19, the ways women's careers were impaired as schools and daycare centers closed, and last week's Supreme Court ruling upholding a Texas law that denies women their constitutional right to abortion and that potentially unleashes abortion bounty hunters, which is all too reminiscent of slavery. All of these provoke the question, what is the progress we've made? Are we stuck staring out the front door at a landscape that never alters in its fundamentals? I am optimistic that we are not. Many historians agree that pandemics are such extreme events that they transform societies. 
As a country, we have not been this engaged in questions of racial equality since the civil rights movement when I was a child. We have not so openly discussed the ways that our economy and our society disadvantage women since the feminist movement of the 1960s and 70s. COVID-19 has mobilized us. This crisis has also emphasized our country's need for a transformed public health system, more cooperation among all levels of government and academia and industry, clear communication from our leaders, and a greater degree of care and responsibility for the whole of our society. So while we've been shutting down, we've also been opening up to new ideas in our public sphere. A time like this also transforms institutions. At Wellesley, the pandemic disrupted a project very important to our community. We were hard at work on a comprehensive strategic plan, the very first for Wellesley in March of 2020, when we had to make the painful decision to send our students home for the rest of the academic year. We put the plan aside to deal with the many logistical challenges we were facing. But when we came together last fall to resume our planning process, it was with a new sense of clarity and purpose. The inequities revealed all around us made us more determined than ever that Wellesley College offer a contrasting example. Our strategic plan puts inclusive excellence at the very heart of a Wellesley education. In fact, my own career as a physician and a scientist has taught me that there is no real excellence without inclusion. Whether we are treating a patient or designing a research study, who we are influences what we see. None of us has all the answers. In every field, it takes a diversity of perspectives to bring us closer to the truth. At Wellesley, we stand with every truth seeker whose voice is in danger of being silenced. So we have offered to host scholars at risk from Afghanistan. We are very proud of a Wellesley alumna in the military who assisted with the evacuation at the Kabul airport. And very proud that our Wellesley alumni network helped nearly 150 Afghan women students from the Asian University for Women to escape Kabul so that someday the world can benefit from their perspectives. But so many others are still imperiled under the Taliban rule and we will continue to look for ways to help. To our new students, the amazing diversity of students around you is such a gift. You have so much to learn from each other, including about yourselves. We work very hard here to create an environment in which each of you will feel a deep sense of belonging and the freedom to be your most authentic selves and to thrive. All of you have lived through a difficult time over the past year and a half, but that experience will itself open up new possibilities. Moments of stasis can be misleading. We feel that we're going nowhere, but we are mulling, observing, thinking, planning, making beautiful videos out of our melancholy. The very longing for change can help to bring it about. We are always growing, sometimes unobserved by ourselves. Most of us have discovered new aspects of our own resilience and resourcefulness during this period. Consider the courage of our red and green classes who were willing to leap into adulthood by starting college during a pandemic. Remote instruction spurred our faculty and staff to rethink what it means to teach and our students to rethink what it means to learn. The pandemic forged deeper bonds within this community because in-person classes and the chance to appreciate each other in three dimensions seem so rare and so wonderful. The beginning of a new academic year is always exciting. 
and I wish it were entirely a fresh page in the sense that the pandemic was behind us. But since it's not, whenever the days seem a little stale, I hope you'll refresh your spirits by reaching out to your amazing mentors and peers. If you experience moments when it seems as if time has stopped, I can assure you it has not. A few years from now, you will look back at your four years at Wellesley and be astonished at the expansion of your mind, character, and power. And whenever you're frustrated by a lack of progress in the world around you, I hope you'll contribute to this community, which aspires to be a model of excellence, equity, and kindness. And then take that experience and translate it into leadership in the world. We have a very beautiful motto at Wellesley, non ministrari sed ministrari. That means that Wellesley students don't stare at the clock on the wall waiting for someone to minister to them. They minister to others. They not only take care of themselves, they turn the hourglass upside down and right what's wrong with the world. We are not stuck in the past. Rather, the pandemic has woken us up to the aspects of our society that deserve to be consigned to the past. It is time to envision and realize a new and better world, and you will contribute to this great project. You start this work right here, right now, and I hope you enjoy every single minute of your Wellesley College experience. I wish you all a year full of love, learning, and growth. Thank you. I know what Paula meant. Wow, it's great to see everybody here. <laughs> it's quite a view. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to add my welcome on behalf of the Wellesley College faculty to our new green class of 2025. Welcome to Wellesley. I'd like to welcome back to campus. For some of you, I realize welcome for the first time the members of the classes of 2024 and 2023. And hail to the purple class of 2022. Many of you I see resplendent in the academic regalia that you will wear at your commencement next spring. And finally, greetings to my colleagues in the faculty and the administration, companions in this strange odyssey of the past 18 months. Today, the very most banal greeting is the most meaningful. It is so good to see you. Convocation marks the dawn of a new academic year. At last year's virtual convocation, I said that the day didn't feel like the start of something. It felt like the middle of something. We were in the middle of organizing ourselves to live out our educational mission together in the midst of pandemic. Today, after a summer of false dawns, we are still, alas, somewhat unbelievably in the middle of something. The challenges we face are different from those of last September, but as we all know, we are still living with constraints and anxieties. At least though, and at long last, we are able to confront our challenges together, all back together 
in this place, face to face. And as it happens, we are reconvening here just as we approach the anniversary of another occasion on which a momentous shock disrupted our world. For a few minutes, I'd like to use that coincidence of timing to reflect on what it means for a small community like ours suddenly to be in the middle of something so much larger than ourselves. This Saturday will mark the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Students and faculty were in their 8.30 classes when news of what had happened in New York filtered through. In Green Hall, we were holding a welcome back reception for administrative staff. In my memory, the conversation just melted away, almost mid-sentence. In those days, we couldn't read, much less watch the news on our phones. So people went in search of a television screen. I found one in the French department common room on the second floor of Green Hall. That's where I watched the Twin Towers fall, sitting in stunned silence with a few colleagues and with a half dozen students who had come for their 950 French class and ended up watching with me and a few others one of the def defining images of the 21st century. At 10.30 that morning, the college's president, her name was Diana Chapman Walsh, posted on official announcements that classes were being canceled for the rest of the day. President Walsh posted four times that day, urging us not to jump to hasty conclusions about what was happening, because there were so many wild rumors flying around, to focus instead on supporting one another. There is much that is not within our power to influence or understand at this time of crisis, she wrote but we can focus our energies on maintaining our community as best we can. That evening, and again the next evening, we held vigils on Severance Green. As the reality sank in and word spread that our own community, our students, our alums, our employees, had been touched directly by the loss of life. Responding to this crisis, called on all our resources of connection. On the Alumni Association website, hundreds of alums began to post to classmates that they were safe. Messages that were then relayed to their friends, professors, and others on campus who knew them. The campus mobilized to contribute to blood drives and to the Red Cross. Student groups mobilized to show their support for Muslim students and staff on campus. The theme of Flower Sunday, which we held just a few days later, was the stages of grief. We put up whiteboards around the campus so that community members could express their feelings about the tragedy. At the same time, as an educational community, we felt compelled not just to grieve, but to try to make sense of 9-11. In mounting an intellectual response, we benefited from efforts that the college had been making over the previous decade to globalize our community and our curriculum. For several years before 2001, the college had embraced a responsibility to educate students with, to quote some words from the era, the knowledge, the skills, the intellectual and emotional attitudes, and a quality of humanity necessary for a new global world what we called our Global Education Initiative, had increased the number of international students here, expanded opportunities for international study, and added new courses in Latin American studies, in South Asian studies, in East Asian studies, and in Middle Eastern studies. After 9-11, there was a wave of soul searching across American higher education about the parochialism of the nation's programs the fact, for example, that in the entire country, only nine undergraduates received a degree in Arabic in the, in the year 2000. In that context, Wellesley could take pride in the progress we had made to globalize our program. 
the fact, for example, that we had taught our first Arabic course the week before 9-11. I don't want to idealize the cohesion or the purposefulness of this community in that difficult moment. Our electronic conferences, those whiteboards across campus, express the same political divisions played out across the nation. I recall tensions about displaying American flags, bitter arguments about whether terrorism could ever be justified. And yet for all that, it was a time of intense solidarity on campus and of intense engagement in the world beyond the campus. 9-11 didn't set us on a new path, but it did encourage us to press forward on the path we were on. It strengthened the college's commitments to extending the reach of our curriculum beyond Eurocentrism. It encouraged our interest in developing programs like the one that eventually became the Albright Institute that connected education in liberal arts disciplines with the experiential perspective of practitioners in the world. It also encouraged the college to be a more active advocate for women's education worldwide. In 2002, 14 months after 9-11, we hosted an important planning meeting at the college club where we're all getting tested, the same space right now, for a new liberal arts university that was about to be established in Bangladesh, the Asian University for Women. That's the same university whose Afghan alums and students, as you just heard from President Johnson, were evacuated from Kabul airport a few days ago. That arc of history from the Twin Towers to Kabul airport reminds us that the events of 9-11 led to two decades of war and upheaval that continue to this day. 18 months into the COVID crisis, I think it's too soon to know whether the events we're living through now will have a similar long-lasting impact. But over this past year, as we have felt the succession of aftershocks in our society, in the world, in our environment, it has seemed increasingly likely that we are still living through a fundamental transition. With COVID, of course, there was no single day that started everything. For us, the closest analog to 9-11 is 3-12. Just before midday on March the 12th, 2020, President Johnson announced that we were moving to remote instruction for the remainder of the spring semester. The news didn't exactly come out of the blue in the same way as the attacks on the World Trade Center had. But there was the same surreal feeling on campus, the same surge of dismay and grief. I experienced it in a meeting that afternoon with all the chairs of the academic departments. The faculty had a thousand questions, most of which my colleagues and I couldn't possibly answer. There were tears in the room, as I know there were tears in classrooms when students read the president's message on your phones. But there was a feeling of solidarity that still gives me goosebumps to recall and a spontaneous determination to do whatever we needed to do for our students. The college's response over the past 18 months has echoed our response after 9-11. We have rallied to keep one another safe. We have focused our educational, material, and emotional resources on supporting our students. At the same time, we have engaged intellectually with the burning questions that the pandemic has highlighted. Questions not just about public health, as the president said, but about racial justice, about climate change, about threats to our democracy. In 2020 and 2021, as in 2001, we have relied on the progress we had already made before the crisis. Our initiatives in anti-racism, for example, have built on the efforts of the previous five years to introduce more inclusive pedagogies at Wellesley. The change agent training pioneered by our science faculty, the pioneering work of our learning and teaching center and of the Office of Intercultural Education. Again, there's no need to idealize ourselves. 
Over the past 18 months, we've had plenty of differences of opinion about the right steps to take, plenty of petitions, plenty of pandemic-related setbacks along the way. And yet, scattered across the world, we have maintained a sense of shared purpose and fulfilled President Johnson's prediction on March 12th that we would all experience a lifelong lesson in resilience and in building community. And now we are all back together. On the evening of 9-11, we urged those at the vigil to feel the beauty and peace of this place. Today, as we gather, not without apprehension, but eager for the solace of connection after so many months of isolation, I hope we can feel again the beauty and the peace of this place which belongs to all of us and which surely will keep us together as we confront the uncertainties and frustrations that still lie ahead. At the same time, let's also feel the promise of this place. Yes, we're in the middle of a public health crisis, but we're also in the middle of something in a different, more optimistic sense. We are on a path. We're on a path to influencing the world unapologetically in the direction of our values. We're on a path to becoming an institution that defines what an inclusive, globally engaged liberal arts college can look like in the 21st century. We're on a path, in the words of our new strategic plan, to amplifying Wellesley's mission for a changing world. COVID is going to complicate our progress in the months ahead. But we were on this path before COVID, and we will continue on it after COVID. Thank you all. Welcome back. And I look forward to a year of being boldly and productively in the middle of something. Thanks. And now I'd like to invite Giselle Mota, Class of 22, College Government President. Thank you, Provost Shannon. Hello, fellow students, esteemed faculty, staff, and administration, and another welcome to Wellesley College's 2021-2022 convocation. For those who don't know me, my name is Giselle Moda, class of 2022, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am beyond thankful and blessed to be serving as this year's college government president. I want to first acknowledge the ancestral land of the Massachusetts and Nipmuc people and elders on whose land we are on today. I am angered by the indigenous, black, Latinx, Asian, Pacific Islander, and all others who have lost their livelihood to build this land that we pride on freedom. I agree with those who have lost their homes and have had their families taken from them, and I am saddened to know that these injustices persist and increase every day. We must not only acknowledge the harm purported on these communities, but must also be mindful to their contributions to institutions like this. It would not be right for me to stand here today and say there is not work to be done. Instead, I encourage each and every one of us to utilize the resources that we have to remain diligent in our strive towards equity, peace, and respect. With that, I want to say we made it. We're here, all right? And I know we usually hear these words on our graduation date at the end of the school year, but not today. Today, we celebrate the beginning. Whether that's getting up and making it in time on Saturday for Joe's fried eggs, fried rice and eggs, excuse me, or getting your luggage under 50 pounds for your flight here, we made it. It's been 545 days or about a year and a half since the day we received the announcement of our evacuation from campus. And this is my first time on this campus since. And trust me when I tell you, I did not expect to come back as your college government president. <laughs> but that's the beauty of college, isn't it? I am definitely not the first and I will not be the last to tell you that you never know what's in store. I won't walk you detail through detail about the ups and downs of my Wolsey journey. 
And you are all kind of lucky because for my family watching, my friends here today, I can chat for a long time. Uh, for those who know me and for those who don't, if there's one thing I'm gonna do is to keep it very real and very honest. The Wolsey College experience, like many other experiences, has, it up, has its ups and downs. Yes, Wolsey is filled with amazing, intelligent, and driven students, but these are not the only things that define us. We are layered, we are intersectional, and we have different stories to tell. This is all to say that yes, while we all sifted through the Wolsey 100 for our applications, our individual experiences will not be the same, and that's okay. Take me, for instance. I have never been a cabinet member, a senator, or a committee member of college government, yet I stand here today as your college government president. I have an amazing support system filled with friends, faculty, and staff, yet I sat on my bed in Schaefer 325 in February of 2020, fully ready, ready to submit my transfer application away from Wellesley. Why did I stay? I came to the reality that my time here was never going to work as long as I was trying to make myself work for Wellesley. I told myself, Giselle, it's Wellesley. Make it work. Suck it up, you know? I thought I was doing something wrong because I couldn't fit this imagined perfect Wolsey student I had curated in my head. Instead, it was only months after the evacuation that I realized I had to make Wolsey work for me. I started to communicate my concerns with professors, seek out different avenues of getting internships that I wanted, and attending things that ultimately brought me joy, which sometimes are mutually exclusive to Wolsey, which is okay. Yes, we attend Wolsey Home to the Stars, but this will things will confuse you, frustrate you, and even anger you. But I'm going to say it again, this is your journey. It is unique and solely yours. I ran for this role because I found it hard to validate my experiences here. I am here to serve as an advocate and an active listener to the students of this campus. I never want anyone to feel discouraged for not having the picture perfect Wellesley journey and to let you know that we are capable of way more than we could ever know. I am also a part of an amazing cabinet who not only serve in their roles, but work together with me to be the best liaisons and advocates for the student body. So I want to give a quick loving shout out to my cabinet, to Francesca, Maya, Imogen, Diavion, Ingrid, Sydney, and Juliana. And this brings me to the point of my speech today. The most important thing I can tell each and every one of you here, and what I forced myself to ram through my head over and over again as my anxiety built up towards coming here, prioritize yourself. I didn't see your grades. I didn't see your assignments. I didn't say that you know, meeting you have. Prioritize yourself. Give yourself grace, please. This last Christmas before the pandemic, a family friend brought a game where each person had to pull out a word and had to remember that with them throughout the year. My word was grace, and I put it back with the hopes to pick an easier one because I thought I'm gonna have to show grace to everybody around me, which is no easy feat. But I came to find out that that grace was meant to be dedicated to me, which trust me was way harder. We are in an environment that can sometimes be intense and stressful, but I encourage you to really take advantage of the little moments that bring you peace and solace. Go to that party or event, COVID-19 restrictions in place, thank you. <laughs> take advantage of the little moments Savor the lash up of coffee on a table, splurge on some hoop nachos, and pay your tabs. Pay your tabs, all right? Communicate your need to that professor. Say no when someone asks you to do something and you can't commit to it. Prioritize yourself and your well-being because there was a significant point in my time here where I didn't. The tide of life and assignments and responsibilities crept up on me and that caused the deterioration of my mental health and ultimately led me to open that transfer application in the first place. We are students on a campus with staff and faculty who are meant to support and teach. We have an administration meant to keep us safe and provide us the best experience possible. However, Wolsey College would not exist with just faculty, staff, and administration. We are here because we serve a purpose as well. Wellesley, at the end of the day, is here for us, for us to learn, to be empowered, and to sustain the relationships that we have, connect that we have created here. Therefore, all facets of our health matter just as much as the first B plus you get or the resume-worthy internship you receive. If we do not prioritize ourselves, our happiness, and spend the time marinating on what brings us joy and what's gonna be truly fulfilling to our lives, this campus fails to fulfill its mission that it prides itself on. So today, at Wolsey College's 2021-2022 convocation, and as your college government president, I firstly congratulate it for making it here today. And I hope that I provide comfort in the chaos and beauty that is to come. In these uncertain times, I encourage all of us to respect and support our sibs, because you never know the day or week someone has had. 
Create spaces where we feel comfortable to ask questions, make mistakes, and speak up. Give yourself and your sibs room to grow. Take a look around, breathe, embrace this moment, the trees, the purple, the gowns, and your support system. Be excited for the friendships that are to come and the memories to be made because they are sweet and will last a lifetime. I can't wait and look forward to growing alongside all the sides of ourselves this year. So cheers to us and cheers to this year. We made it. Thank you, Giselle, first and foremost, for those wonderful and uplifting words. Truly, I think I speak for us all when I say it was exactly what we needed to hear. <laughs> Thank you all for being here this afternoon. My name is Juliana Kenny Serrano. My pronouns are she, hers, and I'm a member of the class of 2022. Let's hear some noise for purple. <laughs> I am beyond honored to be serving as your Chief Justice this year. Before I begin, I would like to offer a land acknowledgement. I recognize that Wellesley College occupies the ancestral, traditional, and unceded lands of the Massachusetts tribe, and I extend my gratitude to the many indigenous peoples who have rich histories here, including the Massachusetts, Wampanoag, and Nipmuc nations. I commit to recognizing, supporting, and advocating for the sovereignty of the indigenous nations whose traditional territories are in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. By offering this land acknowledgement, I affirm indigenous sovereignty, and I thank the Native American Student Association for the language behind this acknowledgement. As I stand here today, I confess that a year ago, I didn't think it would be possible for us all to share the space that we do now. But two years ago, I would have taken it for granted. And there are many things that we take for granted. The class of 2022 assumed we'd have the assurance of a senior year like any other. The class of 2023 imagined they'd ring in their first year as they started it, in person. The class of 2024 couldn't have foreseen beginning college as they did. And I can only imagine that the class of 2025 hoped that by their turn, the world would be righted. Through it all, each and every one of us has shown incredible perseverance and grit. And this fills me with hope for the time that we will share. What lies ahead? Undoubtedly, a bittersweet year as we reflect on all that our community has been through, but also a year dedicated to rekindling connection for seniors and first years alike. And I hope I can speak for all of us when I say that celebrating time-honored traditions as we do today is truly meaningful. Ever since 1919, which we still remember as the year of the world's last pandemic, each and every worldly class has renewed their commitment to living and pursuing a life of honor. As we prepare to continue what they began, let us remember that this renewal marks the beginning of a truly exceptional time. And let us be reminded never to take for granted that which makes Wellesley special, our community. The principles of honesty, integrity and respect are the pillars of the Wellesley experience. But I believe that by extension, kindness, compassion and gentleness follow suit. So give and receive kindness, be gentle with one another, open yourselves to the possibilities that this year brings and embrace each connection you make along the way. And now I hope that you'll join me in the ceremonial recitation of the honor code, which you can find on your programs. As a Wellesley College student, I will act with honesty, integrity, and respect. In making this commitment, I am accountable to the community and dedicate myself to a life of honor. Thank you all, and good luck. I would like to introduce senior class members of the Wellesley College Choir who will sing the alma mater. We 
invite you to remain seated as we are observing COVID protocols and only the choir will sing. Feel free to hum along, but only the choir will sing as we listen and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you to the Wellesley College Choir. Dear community, as we live into this new academic season, may we do so releasing fear and embracing hope. May the lessons of your ancestors, mentors, and this community be a guide and comfort. May we work together towards a more just and peaceful world. And may you live each day rooted in kindness and gratitude. Amen. Go in peace. Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Diesel, and I am the College Marshal. This concludes our convocation ceremony. So please look to your marshals who will lead us in the recessional. Thank you. <laughs>